Okay. Good. Well, friends, uh, <clears throat> welcome to this uh, to this uh, webinar. Uh, and we're going to be uh, discussing and uh, introducing and discussing a very important uh, new publication from WIDA with Oxford University Press on COVID-19 and the informal economy, impact recovery and, and the future. And this is... Uh, Done, of course, jointly with uh, uh, with uh, Wego, you and you wider and Wego. And the moment that the uh, the COVID uh, pandemic hit, uh, of course, uh, uh, the organisations that uh, the ground level organisations that Wego uh, works with and uh, uh, works with immediately felt the impact and immediately moved into action uh, to address the issues uh, that 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 arose for the informal sector for the informal economy. And at the same time, uh, WeGo also launched a series of empirical uh, studies, ground level studies, uh, to actually collect information on how the how the pandemic was affecting the different sectors of the of the of the informal economy. This is extremely important work, uh, which are in fact informed uh, responses at that time. Um, but then, as as the information was collected and and patterns began to emerge. Uh, uh, the analysts of WeGo and, uh, and of course other places also started thinking about these issues. And then I think uh, WeGo uh, uh, partnered with uh, uh, with WIDA uh, and WIDA and WeGo uh, um, worked on this together and brought together a series of papers which combined both very detailed empirical, specific empirical analysis, as well as uh, thinking about the structure of the informal economy and how the interactions between the structure of the informal economy and the nature of the pandemic led to the outcomes that came about. And then from that, trying to think about fut the future and seeing how, uh, how we might react to crises like this in the future uh, and how the structure of the informal economy could be, uh, could be improved, could be, uh, could be restructured to actually better address crises like this in the future. So we have we have uh, uh, the three editors of the volume with us, uh, and they're going to speak uh, uh, to different different parts of the uh, different parts of the volume. And Kunal uh, Sen, the director of Wider, will introduce that just now. Will that be followed by Mike Rogan, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, Marty Chen will will uh, will speak after that. So basically, uh, we're going to be looking at impact, recovery, and the future uh, in terms of COVID nineteen and the informal economy. So, uh, Kunal, can I hand over to you now to take uh, to take over? Yes, Ravi, thanks so much. So, uh, I want to introduce the book and how it's structured, and take you through exactly how we're going to do the presentations uh, today. Uh, Kunal, so, can I can I just can I just stop one minute, one, Kunal? Sure. Can, one minute, just to just to let the audience know that uh, we have a substantial <clears throat> time for Q and A, uh, and basically uh, we have we, we've set aside twenty five to thirty minutes for Q and A, so there'll be plenty of time. Uh, to pose questions uh, uh, to our speakers and get responses. Thank you. Sorry about that, Kunal. Go on. Yes, sorry. No, that's absolutely fine. Um, so and I'm really delighted uh, as the director of Univider to part that Univider partnered with Vigo in producing this uh, volume. And very much it reflects, the, the book itself reflects the different contributions that the different, uh, our colleagues in Univider and also Vigo have made uh, in the book across all the different sections of the book. So the book itself, um, as an introductory chapter, setting out what the book is about, some of the important stylized facts about informal employment uh, and what we know from a more secondary literature on this, uh, on, the, on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. And then we have three sections. And there's a reason why we have these three sections. The first section is on impact of the pandemic. So it's looking at what, what happened to particularly informal employment in different parts of the developing world. And we cover Latin America, Asia, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And that's one strength of the book that we cover the three important developing regions. And we also try to provide a nuanced approach to understanding its impact. And we, I mean, as we'll see, the, the approach of the, the impact of the pandemic was very nuanced, very different in different contexts. And that's important to keep in mind. So the first section of the book, the first substantial section of the book has seven chapters covering, as I said, the global South. And it's really trying to understand the impact of the pandemic on diverse groups of workers uh, in different contexts. That's the section, the first section. The second section is on recovery. And this section is about response, recovery, and stimulus measures that governments have taken with a view to understanding the implications of the stimulus measures, the recovery responses, and the impacts on informal employment. So it's really about the after the onset of the impact of the onset of the pandemic, 
How did governments respond? How did reco re recoveries uh, take place? And what can we learn from this recovery and response packages that we've seen in different parts of the global South? And the third uh, sector is a very important section for us because, and this is why this particular volume is timely, because it's not just about what happened in the past, it's about what can happen in the future, because potentially we may see something similar crisis as we have seen with COVID-19. So it'd be more forward-looking and reflect on the future of informal employment and labor markets more generally post-COVID. So I will present the first part, impact. Mike Rogan from Vigo is going to present the second part on recovery, and Marty Chen also from Vigo is present the third part on the future of informal work. So, and there's also, the, and we also have a section reflection, Ravi, Ravi Gandhi himself has also contributed to this section, and of course, the conquering section, uh, sort of summarizing the volume, but particularly what are the key policy implications that we get from this, uh, this body of work. So moving forward, so I want to now speak about impact, and I want to say that what we have learned from the several case studies that we have in, our, in the volume, and I should mention that we use both mixed methods, we use quantitative methods, existing surveys, on our own surveys where we could, along with qualitative uh, data. So it's a very much a mixed methods approach to understanding impact. So moving uh, moving on. So what we for the first point is on the severity of the of the impact of the of the pandemic, and this is absolutely clear from all the case studies that we have in the volume. There were large and nearly disproportionate effect of the pandemic and related policy responses. One which was very important was of course obviously government lockdowns on informal employment. Just to give you some numbers, to give you a sense of the magnitudes we are talking about, roughly 22 million jobs were lost across five countries in Latin America, the chapter by Marty Chen and Van and Joan Bannock. Uh, the chapter on South Africa finds lasting effects on poverty, not just what happened immediately after the onset of the, of the pandemic and lockdowns, but even much later. Uh, so we have some also long lasting effects. The chapter by Mike Rogan and Daniel Skinner finds 2.2 million net jobs lost in the second quarter of 2020. COVID-19 pandemic really the onset was in 20, the first quarter of, of the of 2020. And by the fourth quarter of 2020, this is South Africa, I should be clear, 1.4 million jobs less as compared to 2019. So quite severe impact. And this is clear from this graph we have from the Rogan and Skinner chapter in South Africa, where we've seen in the first quarter, of course, just pandemic comes in, and then lockdown start, and it's both in restrictions start. And we can see the very disproportionate effect it's having on informal employment. All through the quarters that we see, quarter two, quarter three, quarter, quarter four of 2020. And that's pretty obvious in the big losses we're seeing. For example, quarter two in South Africa, 29% uh, drop in informal employment versus 8% drop in formal employment. So there's quite a different effect on informal versus formal employment. Moving forward. The second thing that's important is that perhaps this, the point of severity is now well understood. I think we know now how, we do know now how severe the impact of the pandemic was on informal employment. But perhaps we don't recognize enough that there has been quite a strong heterogeneous effect in different dimensions. The first important heterogeneous effect is on gender. So this is the particular uh, graph on the left-hand side is from the chapter by Dan et al. on Ghana, where we actually collected data, post-retrospect data, on how the, uh, the pandemic affected different types of workers and different types of you know, employment and by gender. And you can see that February 2020, we have the real earnings in uh, in Ghanaian currency, of course, a big drop. We did a survey in August to September 2020, by which time we already were quite a significant part of the pandemic itself. Big drop in earnings. But interestingly, when you see the by period and, period and gender, we see a much more larger drop in earnings of women workers compared to men workers, 30% 30, 30 actually, of female workers versus male workers. So. This is telling us that the effect is not being neutral or the same across different groups of workers. Women workers have been particularly badly affected. And there's a reason for that, because we know that informal self-employment has been very badly affected by the pandemic and lockdown, and lockdown uh, measures. And women workers tend to be more in, in informal self-employment. That's also clear in the same graph on the left-hand side at the bottom. And you can see again, informal self-employment earnings have dropped substantially compared to what 2020 as compared to uh, obviously formal self-employment and formal wage employment, but even compared to informal wage employment. And that's an important point, that the, like work status, we see also significant heterogeneity, informal self-employment versus informal wage employment. Then moving on to also type of work. Uh, sorry, no, sorry, going, if you're going to go back one slide, if that's okay. Uh, I was going to point out in the previous slide, 
Um, if you can go back one slide, thank you. Uh, on the right hand side of the slide, that uh, that slide you can see in front of you, you also see by different types of workers, there's been significant differential impact. Home-based workers in particular have been very badly affected. If you see this particular graph on the right hand side, even in mid 2021, 2021, there was significantly less uh, earnings compared to pre-COVID earnings for this group of workers. The next badly affected group is street vendors, but we see more recovery among domestic workers in 2021 and also among West speakers. So even among informal, informal workers, these are mostly self-employed and some wage, uh, wage employed, we are seeing differential impact by the type of work they're doing. And that's again linked to movement restrictions, lockdowns, and so on. Moving on. Next slide. Yeah, so, uh, th sorry, just again, sorry, previous slide. So now if you see, so, that, so we made the point that by gender, there is heterogeneity. We made the point by work status, there is a gener uh, there's heterogeneity of impact. We made the point by type of work, there is heterogeneity of impact. And now in this slide, we see by location, there's heterogeneity of impact. And it's interesting to see in this particular slide, and this is a study by Chen et al. in the, in the book, uh, 11 City Study, we can see that in this star slide, in some cities, in the different parts of the global south, there was recovery in 2021, mid 2021. But in some other cities, actually, you regressed in terms of earnings. So, for example, you look at Durban. Durban, 50 percent of pre uh, pre-COVID earnings in mid 2020. When you get to mid 2021, only 31 percent of pre-COVID earnings. So, in Durban, for example, things got worse, and that's also true for other cities too. While there were other uh, while so you have cities like uh, Dakar and uh, and and Ahmedabad uh, and so on, that there was recovery in 2021. The other city where we also see regress uh, is a, in Bangkok, where again... Uh, Bangkok, uh, Kunal, uh, Kunal uh, uh, a minute or two left, yeah? Okay, sure. So moving on. Um, so the third, uh, third, her third dimension of impact was on vulnerabilities. And that's perhaps quite understandable. There were pre-existing inequalities of fault lines widened during the pandemic. Uh, which again got worse in the, in the pandemic and an uh, uh, ensuing uneven recovery. This varied by context, by regional context, by country context. We saw quite different outcomes by type of work, status in employment, gender, caste, and race. And this graph from the study by Raman et al. for Bangladesh shows that how, whether you look at non-poor, moderately poor, uh, or extreme poor, or, or vulnerable non-poor, you see very similar effects on the incomes. Uh, over over the over the over the last couple of years since the data was collected. So again, that's really interesting how we see ex even for those who are non-poor how they have also suffered to the pandemic. Moving on. Now, coping strategies. The one one particular way that houses coped when they faced this effect of the pandemic on the employment and the earnings uh, and, and so on was to borrow money. That was a very common coping strategy, and they borrowed from friends. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, and microfinance institutions where they were, where that was possible, and so borrowing money and getting it more into debt was a very common coping strategy, which was not particularly very positive for, for the long run. The drawing down savings, reducing money, but also reducing consumption, and particularly non-food consumption. So adjusting the consumption basket to essentially focus on food consumption only for survival is a very common coping strategy, and this is also clear from the Raman et al. boundary study, where you can see where where households tried to keep certain kinds of food uh, expenditures going, which was essentially on pulses and fish, while of course they were trying to cut back expenditures on so-called luxury goods, if you could call them that, milk and meat, which are very important, of course, for protein and so on. So there was this differential uh, uh, coping strategy, not only with trying to cope by borrowing, but also in terms of how they adjusted their food basket, the consumption baskets too. Let me stop so, here. Uh, yeah. to my time. Good. Well, thank you very much indeed, Kunal, for that uh, overview of uh, of the different uh, different aspects of the impact. So let us now move to uh, uh, Mike Rogan, who will uh, talk about the recovery part uh, of the story. Mike, thanks, Ravi, um, and thanks, thanks, Kunal. Um, I won't be presenting slides; um, just speaking to the the contributions in the in the middle part of the the volume. Uh, Following those seven uh, very empirical and, and detailed chapters on, on the, the heterogeneous uh, impact of the pandemic on uh, informal workers in a number of contexts, the two middle chapters take a zoom out and, uh, and try and understand government responses to the pandemic, particularly in countries with, with high levels of, of informal employment. 
Um, in the first uh, uh, chapter in the middle part of the book, Michael Denghua and, and colleagues uh, look at government short-term responses to the pandemic uh, in three sub-Saharan African countries, trying to uh, map both the progression of the pandemic in, in different contexts and the way that governments uh, were able to respond. Uh, then in the second chapter, uh, Sibiwe and Shlana and colleagues uh, look at the, the sort of medium to longer term economic recovery approaches of governments through the lens of uh, too low income and too middle income uh, economies. So I think probably the best way to, to summarize the, the middle section of the volume is to, is to think about sort of three overlapping points between the short term responses of governments and the, the longer term economic recovery plans of, of governments. And again, all in context with relatively high levels of informal uh, employment. And just as a reminder, at the time this, this volume was, was being uh, written, uh, governments were talking in various forms of, of the longer term recovery and different ways of, you know, to use the buzzword, uh, building back better. So what does that actually mean and, and how did it unfold in, in context with uh, High levels of informality, and where does that leave us now? Which is which is really the point of the book, and then leads into the the third part, which is about future implications uh, from the crisis. Well, I I think of these three points. Um, uh, the first one is is perhaps the more relevant to the future, and that's the fact that there was a real merging of uh, the response and the recovery periods, keeping in mind that. Uh, in most of these countries, the pandemic led directly into the cost of living crisis with which we're still um, uh, dealing at the at the moment. So just as one example, the IMF published recently that uh, food prices between 20, uh, 2000 and 2022 increased by 24% globally. And if you sort of uh, try and understand the impact of this, um, uh, this cost of living crisis on a context such as Kenya, which is featured in both of the, the chapters in this um, middle section of the volume, where working poverty before the pandemic was already at uh, 54%, uh, where 80% of workers are informal. Quite obviously, the, the impact of this ongoing cost of living crisis is disastrous in, in, in contexts such as this. Uh, the other way that there was a real sort of merging of the of the response to the pandemic and the longer term recovery was in the policies themselves. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, both sets of authors in these chapters analyzed the government responses in the short term and the and the longer term. And what they both seemed to find was that these short term uh, stimulus packages that were introduced tended to be blended with uh, longer term development policies, often five or 10 year uh, development plans and sort of combine short term uh, uh, sort of relief measures with longer term or doubling down on longer term uh, economic policies. So it becomes quite difficult to disentangle the, the policy responses between the short and the longer term. And particularly as one crisis uh, bled into the next and, and in fact emanated from the, uh, the original pandemic crisis. So I think the second point that, that both uh, sets of chapters make quite well uh, is the imbalance of the, of the responses, both across countries and, and, and uh, within countries. Um, so one way to think about this in the global level is uh, one of the chapters uh, mentions that of the entire global fiscal response to the crisis, uh, only 13.8% of funds uh, uh, were concentrated in uh, emerging economies and less than one half of 1% of the global uh, fiscal stimulus was spent in developing economies. These developing economies are of course, where the vast majority of, of workers are, are informal. Even looking within subsets of countries, you could see quite different responses um, to the pandemic, both in the short term and the, the long term. Uh, the chapter by Michael Donkwa and colleagues looked at uh, the short term responses of Ghana, Kenya and South Africa uh, to the crisis. And it does a very careful job of mapping the different ways that the pandemic itself uh, progressed in these countries and then the way that governments uh, respond to them. Uh, and there's quite a bit of detail in these chapters, but to pull out one example, uh, in, in this case from the South African context, there's a really interesting analysis of the way that South Africa had to very suddenly uh, address a large hole in its otherwise relatively comprehensive um, social protection system 
to meet the needs, particularly of, of informal workers who were who were left without any support at the at the outset of the of the pandemic. But the authors there um, uh, very carefully distinguished between the types of interventions which uh, matched with the realities of the labor market in those countries uh, and those that, that sort of largely missed the mark in terms of uh, protecting the most vulnerable workers. Uh, and then in terms of the, the longer term economic recovery, uh, Sabiwe and Shlana and colleagues again looked at Kenya uh, and South Africa as well as Bangladesh and, and Thailand. So examples of two middle income countries and two, two low income countries. And again, vast differences in the way that these countries uh, approached the recovery uh, in the sense of the immediate term economic recovery and linking uh, these recovery measures with their long term development goals. Um, no, Mike, a, a, couple, a couple more minutes, yeah. Yeah, great, I'm, I'm almost finished. Thanks, Ravi. Um, and again, the example here that stands out is, is that of Thailand, which, uh, which had a more uh, sort of employment-based response and with a particular focus on, on supporting the existing livelihoods of, of informal workers compared to the, the other three countries. And then I think the final point uh, that comes out of these, these two chapters is, is the way that policy often didn't map very well onto the realities of the labor markets um, in, in the countries which were, uh, which were studied. Um, for example, quite a few of um, uh, the policy measures taken both in the short and the medium term were aimed at creating new jobs uh, and depended very much on economic growth, which is laudable in and of itself, but didn't say much about the, the impact that was described in the first uh, portion of the volume on informal workers and were largely silent on ways to support um, the working poor in their existing livelihoods. In other words, I think both chapters made an argument that policy was working very much from the world that we would like to live in, uh, rather than than launching off the base of, of the reality of the labor markets in these in these particular countries. Uh, both sets of chapters pointed to strong gender imbalances uh, in the groups of workers that that were supported, and in particular uh, identified uh, potential for improvements in social protection and rethinking the way social protection uh, covers the most vulnerable workers in the labor markets. And I know Marty's going to, to speak on that. Uh, so to conclude, I, I think both chapters uh, probably would, authors of those chapters would be comfortable making the point uh, that the severity of the impact on informal uh, workers in low and middle income countries was not well matched by the, the economic response um, by the governments of those countries. Um, and again, plenty of plenty of detail in, in those two chapters, and we were, we were really grateful to those authors for, for helping us think that through. Um, the forward part of the book um, comes next, and I will hand over to Marty for that. Uh, thanks, Mike. Just before Marty uh, starts, let me just uh, uh, check with Linus and co about, about the Q&A portion, because after Marty, we'll have the Q&A portion. And I guess we're asking people to submit their, uh, put their questions in the chat. Is that right, Lini? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's, uh, uh, please, please uh, start putting your questions in the chat function and we'll, and the, and the speakers will pick those up. So with that, Marty, over to you. Thanks so much, Ravi. Um, next slide, please. I'm asked to speak about the future, which is the final section of the volume, except for the reflections and conclusion. And, but first, let me just say a few of the key lessons from the COVID crisis regarding the informal economy. We've heard about two of them. Um, <clears throat> one from Kunal about the disproportionate impact of the COVID crisis on informal workers and the fact that many were left in a very deep hole of decreased earnings, depleted assets and increased debt, and of course entered into the uh, cost of living crisis um, that Mike referred to. Um, the other is the relative neglect of informal workers in economic recovery and stimulus measures um, that uh, Mike has spoken to. But I think there's a third empirical lesson, uh, which is the recognition that many of these informal workers are essential frontline workers, or put conversely, many essential frontline workers are informally employed. And this includes those who produce, process, prepare, and, and distribute food. They provide health, child, elder care. 
They provide sanitation and recycling services, construction and transport services. And all of these were, were very necessary during the crisis and exposed many um, <clears throat> to particular risks. There were some more normative lessons as well, if you will, um, the sort of structural disadvantages faced by the informal workers before the crisis, um, which played out during the crisis, including the negative narratives about the informal economy and the often very hostile policy and legal environment. And this leads to the need for a better deal going forward for informal workers in order to um, both reduce poverty and inequality, but also to generate robust and inclusive growth. Having said there's a need for a better deal, the WeGo network is very concerned and has been monitoring of the retreat to the bad old deal and in some cases, a worse new deal as in the name of public health or economic recovery, uh, the livelihoods and workspaces of informal workers have been and are being destroyed. Next. So what is this better deal for the informal workforce? Um, the final section has uh, two chapters, one on social protection and one on a new social contract but there were economic policies that were also being called for in um, a couple of or more of the chapters on impact and in recovery. So the chapter from Bangladesh, um, Zillar Hussein and Imran Mateen, they called for macroeconomic investment in healthcare, in education, transportation, and utilities to reduce the expenditure burden of the informal workforce. And the WeGo chapter um, <clears throat> called for sectoral policies to address the constraints and barriers faced by different groups of informal workers, notably inclusive urban planning and design in support of the urban informal workforce. In terms of the last two chapters on the one on social uh, <clears throat> protection, called for universal social protection around which there is sort of a growing consensus that it's important, but also called for informal workers to be involved in determining the design, the benefits, the financing of social protection. And I've added here what Ravi uh, spoke about in his reflections that we need stress testing of the social protection systems for future crises. In the chapter on a new social contract, um, there was the role of the dominant economic partners, and they're not always employers because many informal workers are self-employed. So the dominant economic players ensured fair employment and commercial relationships in their supply chains. And the role of the state is to regulate those employment and commercial relationships but also, especially in the case of the self-employed informal workers to provide fair access to public space, public services, public procurement, to have fair progressive taxation regimes, and very importantly, freedom from harassment and stigmatization, harassment by local government officials and stigmatization by the policy makers. Next slide. There was all cu always cutting through all these chapters, a realization that there were two important enabling conditions for this better deal for informal workers. One was that there needed to be a change, a shift in the dominant narratives and mindsets toward the informal economy, a shift towards recognizing first that 61% of all workers globally, 2 billion, are informally employed and it's the highest 90% in developing countries. And that the majority of informal workers are from poor households. And these households have been made poorer and more vulnerable during COVID. The second recognition is that many informal workers are essential workers, contribute to the economy, society and the environment, 
but they find it difficult to register and comply with the existing laws and policies. They often pay taxes or fees, but receive few benefits in return. And they simply cannot work their way out of poverty in a hostile policy and legal environment. The second enabling condition is the inclusion of informal worker organizations and leaders in policy-making rule-setting processes, including the design and implementation of the sectoral economic policies to ensure that their constraints are met and are addressed and their needs. Um, the universal social protection policies to ensure uh, <clears throat> the needs, the design and benefits meet their needs and the financial system for social protection is progressive and, and addresses their financial capacity. And the new social contract chapter uh, calls for ensuring that informal workers are able to hold the state and the dominant economic actors accountable for the decent working conditions. Marty, a, a couple of minutes more, okay? Okay, I think only one more slide. Next. In the chapters, but also in two of the reflections um, in the book, there a compelling case was made for this better deal for informal workers. One focused on the runaway wealth and the deepening poverty and inequality during the COVID crisis. And in his reflections for this volume, uh, sociologist Jan Bremen highlights that, and I quote, the pandemic has further widened the already steep gap on both sides of the welfare fence. What used to be called the poverty line has taken shape as an unsurmountable barrier. And then the second compelling case is the structural inequalities and disadvantages that the informal workers faced before, during, and after the crisis. The crisis. And in her reflections for this uh, volume, economist um, Barbara Harris White focuses on the essential but stigmatized waste workers, informal workers in India in the waste sector, mainly from low caste and tribal communities, and calls for transformative change in the waste system to ensure decent work and occupational health and safety for informal waste workers. And the point of sharing this example is the same case can be made for most informal workers in most occupations, namely that their work is essential, but they continue to be stigmatized. They are often from disadvantaged communities and what really is needed is transformative change in the economic and planning system. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you very much to uh, Marty, to Mike, and to Kunal for that uh, for those uh, in, in, introductory uh, uh, in, the introduction to the volume. Uh, let's move into the Q and A part of the uh, of the of the session of the webinar. Uh, we have we have two or three questions already. Uh, uh, Mike, the first one was directed to you. Uh, could you repeat the question as well, or, or re uh, restate the question and then uh, give a response to it so that people know what the question is before you answer it? Sure, thanks. Um, if it's the one I'm thinking of, uh, it's asking if I could speak more about the employment-based response of Thailand. Um, what did that look like from the perspective of the, the informal economy? Uh, Mike, um, but also, but there's, there was also a more general formula that Laura sent a, a follow-up thing, which was uh, she says, um, "Is social protection the best way to reach informal workers?" Would be uh, was another type of question. That she um, a follow-up question that she had. Great, yeah, and this is uh, Laura Elfers from WeGo yeah. in yeah. in South Africa. Yeah. So the 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 Thailand National Recovery Plan. Uh, use the language of a, a grassroots uh, recovery. Uh, in particular, it was hoping to absorb uh, 
uh, informal workers. Uh, roughly 60% of, of the workforce in, in Thailand is informal into new sectors uh, with a particular focus on green sector. Um, uh, so less carbon intensive uh, industries. So it was uh, about two things. One was uh, absorbing informal workers into new sectors. And then the second was uh, promoting localization. In other words, trying to draw uh, informal workers into global value chains and existing domestic supply chains. Uh, and the reason that the authors uh, singled out that as, as different from the, the recovery approaches in, in some of the, the, the other economies was because it was the only one that explicitly mentioned uh, informal workers and supporting them in their, in their current livelihoods. I think it's probably important to, to note at this stage that these chapters were uh, based on an, scans or analyses of, of policy documents. Um, so there's a real question about how effective some of these uh, responses were. I think even at the time of writing, we don't have the full picture of how effective the, either the short term or the, or the medium term economic recovery strategies uh, have been. But Thailand stood out quite a bit from uh, from from the other countries, and in, in this case, the uh, the two low income countries and and the South African um, economy and, and response. Uh, in terms of the the question about uh, social protection, um, uh, the question um, is local protection the best way uh, to reach uh, informal workers. I think it would probably, and, and most people I think would agree, most of the contributors, that is, it forms one part of a comprehensive uh, support package for informal workers. And that doesn't necessarily have to be related specifically uh, to the crisis. Um, so the argument is that uh, if, if uh, workers have access to, for example, universal health, as, as is largely the case in places like Thailand, uh, it improves productivity in their, in their current livelihoods. But uh, in the later chapters of the book, um, uh, we have one chapter uh, specifically devoted to lessons learned on, on social protection from the crisis. Um, the author of that chapter is Laura Elfers and Lorian Jurgens Grant. Um, uh, how it fits into, um, how it both poses challenges for the design of social protection, but also the way social protection uh, fits into a range of, of ways to support uh, informal workers. And some of the later chapters uh, look at other methods apart from social protection. But I think the, the argument of the book as a whole, including those in the middle, are that social protection lessons uh, were one of the key takeaways from, from this crisis and the design of those social policy, um, uh, both responses and, and social protection policies more broadly are hugely important to, to informal workers. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, thanks, Mike. So there are two questions uh, that I see, uh, uh, link related questions. One is uh, from Maria Cristina about what constraints did government face in implementing policies towards inf uh, 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 for informal workers during this period? And the second one uh, uh, is from Ladidi uh, Kolo uh, about what are the, uh, uh, Marty, your point about including uh, informal workers in decision-making processes I suppose the question is really asking for perhaps for, for more specificity. Uh, what what um, what might be examples of where these sorts of things have happened and have worked? Um, maybe you could speak a little bit to that, and perhaps Kunal can speak more generally to what sorts of uh, resistance governments have, uh, would face in in implementing the policies that are recommended in this volume, for example. Does that make a good division of labor, Marty? Sure, I Marty, might say a little. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I might on. say a little bit about government as well. Um, I think, and just picking up from where Mike left off and in response to Laura's question, I think throughout this book and certainly in, in Wigo's work more generally is social protection and social policies is only one part of the response. And, one, and we very much had hoped that there'd be more integration of informal workers into economic and stimulus uh, measures than was possible. And in terms of the actual immediate uh, relief kind of response, what was exposed was the inadequacies in the social registries, the in social protection systems. And I think um, the lack of integration of informal workers into economic recovery and stimulus measures reflects 
the negative narratives about the informal economy. They just aren't seen as part of economic growth. And yet they're the broad base of the economy and you can't have robust growth unless and until they are also supported or you could have more robust um, growth if they, if they were supported. So um, in terms of the opportunities for informal workers to engage in policy dialogues, the WeGo network is committed to that. And so we have examples, um, let's say globally, of facilitating delegations of informal worker leaders to important global um, policy dialogues. So we get a delegation to almost every uh, informal labor um, organization annual conferences in June, um, just about now. <laughs> and World Urban Forums, Habitat 3, COPS, getting the workers to those um, global discourses to speak in their own voices, in their own right, with WeGo facilitating the delegations. We also have cities in which um, <clears throat> we have partners or we have team who are helping to open doors, policy doors, to facilitate uh, discourse at um, the city level. And at the national level, we work with partners um, to engage in, um, in fighting for particular uh, policy changes. And um, so there's a lot of examples. You can go to the WECO website. There's clearly a need for more examples, but it's an active um, engagement. And the workers are pretty much every day having to negotiate their, their livelihoods with local officials. And what helps is to be able to be uh, engage in more formal policy dialogues around the issues of, it could be dump closures, it could be public space for street vendors, it could be um, housing and basic infrastructure services for home-based workers and integration of waste pickers into solid waste management. Those are the areas where we have ongoing dialogues. So, uh, Kunal, a response from you, and that, that, let me just flag two other questions that have come that have come in. Uh, uh, one is uh, in terms of gig workers. Uh, do we see creation of gig work during the C nineteen period? Uh, uh, how how did how did the patterns of work change? Perhaps some of the chapters may have spoken to that. Uh, and the second one, the second question is uh, from uh, Emmanuel. Um, uh, in, uh, about the effect, again, it's really it's about the effectiveness of, of policies. Uh, Mike, uh, after Kunal spoken, maybe you could give one or two specific examples in South Africa from South Africa about how government policies were actually, actually affect, give the positive side, how they were actually effective in supporting informal sector workers. That might be a good thing. Uh, uh, Kunal? Yes, yeah, so I think if you look at the responses that governments have, uh, have uh, taken in the, in the post pandemic period, especially just after the launch of the pandemic. As uh, Mike talks a little bit about that in our chapters in recovery section, does discuss this that there was a bias towards more formal workers, protection, predicting formal workers. Now it just happened by design sometimes, but but in happened just by by accident really. So for example, in South Africa, there was wage subsidies given to formal firms to keep their workers on uh, on the payroll, even though um, if, you know and to protect them from job loss. And of course, that effectively protected formal sector workers, not informal workers. In Ghana, for example, there was a lot of support for micro enterprises, so providing credit and so on. But again, they were registered enterprises, so they were formal micro enterprises. So now that was partly to be do with the fact there was an informational problem for southern governments, not to know exactly who to reach out. So I do think there was an informational problem here. It was a genuine informational problem here that they faced. The second problem they faced at that time when the pandemic started was the problem of technology not being there to reach out to informal workers. Now, actually, there's been a lot of progress in using digital methods to reach out to, uh, to uh, formal work, informal workers for cash transfers and so on. At that time when this happened, the pandemic happened, everybody was taken by surprise. And I do think one positive thing that's happened out of this is the fact that there are a lot more digital payments happening um, for informal workers uh, over the last couple of years. So that's a positive, de a positive development, but that was not the case at the beginning of the pandemic. Now, it's also true to say, when you look at our chapters of impact, 
that differential the, the differential impact of the pandemic meant that you had to have more targeted responses. And that was not the case. And there was partly, again, an information problem. Now we know that home-based workers are the ones who are mostly badly affected. Perhaps that was not understood at that time of the, uh, the pandemic, uh, onset of the pandemic. Now we know, for example, that we have to think about self informal self-employed more than perhaps the way it, um, <laughs> informal wage employed. So these are things we know now. And hopefully for the future, this information that we hopefully this volume itself has contributed to and help policymakers more in the future to reaching out to the informal workers who kind of missed out uh, in the actual implementation of the recovery response packages. I do think this were genuine informational problems. They were technological issues. And I think those are things perhaps we need to keep in mind for the future. Thanks. Uh, Mike, some uh, a couple of examples from South Africa would might help here. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I think it would you you would have to mention the the most effective uh, responses in terms of uh, supporting informal workers would be uh, the social relief of distress grants. It it took quite a long time to get off the ground uh, because the South African government essentially had to rejig its social protection system to address the large hole um, for unemployed working age adults or working age age adults in the working in the informal economy. Those two groups had to be uh, identified and and supported through this grant. Uh, the grant has become so popular in South Africa that it's uh, um, it's still in effect. Uh, it's gone through several phases and is very likely going to be the the foundation for the design of a basic income grant as um, as declared by government uh, within the last uh, couple of weeks. But apart from that, um, the mantra of the South African um, government uh, was industrialization through localization as a way to recover from the pandemic. Um, this involved a, a whole range of, of elaborate initiatives to support SMMEs, uh, low interest working capital loans, uh, prioritizing um, uh, small businesses uh, and, and what in South Africa we often refer to as the township economy into local supply chains and government procurement processes. Uh, sadly, though, we and somewhat frustrating, we don't have much data on on the outcomes of, of these policies. But it, in large parts, the South African response was around this range of supporting entrepreneurs, uh, which uh, ostensibly includes uh, small uh, informal firms uh, and, a, and a massive social protection uh, response, which is I think still reverberating through the policy space in, in South Africa. Um, so in, in a nutshell, that was the, the sort of South African response. Specifically are there, the are there any, uh, are there any, uh, uh, is there anything covered in the volume about gig workers and the shifting patterns of work during this period? Uh, that, that's one of the questions that uh, that's been posed uh, by uh, Miriam Katunze. Hmm? Well, I can Could just I? say yeah. that what I think we see, but uh, you know, the data is not, all there or it hasn't been fully analyzed um, but the gig economy um, is more dominant in developing a uh, developed country sorry rather than in developing but it is um, increasing in developing countries and it's seen in um, in several sectors of course you know transport is one uh, food delivery is another it's entered into um, domestic work. Um, it's entered into um, the waste pickers realm. Um, and what we're tracking is whether the entry of this gig platform way of, of um, arranging commercial relations is really helps or hurts. And I think it's a mixed story and we have to track it very carefully. Um, but of course, the gig platform workers for the most part are informally employed. So it's a new face of informality that needs to be better understood and tracked. I think that's how I would summarize what we know. So, so Kunal, I, had, I mean, you can answer, I had another question that I wanted to pose uh, more generally, but uh, to Kunal uh, as well. And it relates a little bit to Mike's uh, thing that in fact, we're now hit by the cost of living crisis, uh, which, according to some economic analysis, may well be linked to the fiscal exposures that were undertaken during uh, during the COVID uh, during the COVID period. So we have uh, uh, an, a, perhaps a, I don't know, a dilemma of some sort that in terms of fiscal space, all of these things that we're recommending 
require fiscal space. Uh, and if there isn't fiscal space, uh, and you nevertheless use that use the space that is not there, then we may well get pressures which lead to the cost of living crisis and so on. So, Kunal, how do you think about those sorts of trade offs uh, for the for uh, in terms of the future crises, the crises to come? I think, in fact, it's a question that we have for Emmanuel on this. I don't think you. Yes, exactly, exactly. That. I'm yeah. About. Which is that you know it's fine to have a social protection program, but who's going to pay for it? Mm -hmm. And of course, we have in many low income countries, especially in Africa, donor donor funded. Uh, social protection programs, but as we see increasing cuts in ODA, that's really not sustainable, right? Mm -hmm. So we need to find domestic resources to fund social protection pro uh, programs. And the challenge is then how do you mobilize domestic revenue, that is taxes, to do that? And so uh, as uh, as perhaps many people know, UNEY has been working with revenue authorities in Africa, try to find ways to raise taxes from, from both domestic and international sources. And that's a very really important agenda because otherwise we can talk about social petition programs uh, for a long time, but without really, really understanding exactly how will they be financed. And we have to understand right now, there's also a huge problem with debt in, in Africa and also elsewhere, uh, where there is no clear solution because a lot of the debt is with, for private, with private creditors. So increasing domestic taxation, domestic revenues is a really the priority. And the many mm -hmm. things that can be done on that, I don't, don't need to get through into this, but certainly there is a lot of potential, for example, taxing high net worth individuals, which has not happened as much in South Africa, in Africa, but it's been reliant on indirect taxes like that. So there is a so it's potential there, but there is an important issue here that if you're thinking of social protection as a way to think about the future crisis, you also need to think about financing, how to finance social protection. Thanks. Yeah, no, I think that's that's uh, that's a very important point for uh, in terms of making sure the macroeconomic sort of uh, hangs together in this thing. And uh, one of the issues on taxation as well, Kunal, might be we all mention net worth individuals. Uh, there may, I mean, the issue of actually a getting to them and b even if we get to them, uh, is there enough revenue in in, uh, in those coffers to actually finance the things that we that we're talking about? Uh, you know, we we have headlines about high net worth individuals doing this and this, but. Uh, it would be important for wider and others to quantify uh, how much, how much in the way of resources one could actually get by uh, uh, by taxing taxing those things. So I think that that's important work for wider for wider to do. Um, uh, I think yes, we have uh, yes Ravi, yes please Marty, go on. Make go a ahead. point. Not all of the interventions being called for require fiscal space. No, I no. mean the reduction of the negatives mm -hmm. against the informal workers. A lot of that does not inquire. Require <laughs> mm -hmm. and um, you know pro mm -hmm. the public space and public services and public procurement. It's a question of who gets those. It's it's more a distribution issue than just increasing the fiscal space. So I think we should remember that it's not all a trade off. On no, no. Uh, well, no, ab absolutely, Marty. I think in terms of the regulation side, that's very clear. But in, uh, on the on the social protection side. Uh, clearly, we need that we need the fiscal space, uh, right. and the, the question: Where is it going to? It, it, obviously, it'll have to come from somewhere, and if it if it comes from the upper end, upper reaches of the income distribution, then that that is redistribution, and that we have to face. I we have to face up to that. Uh, uh, well, uh, and here Emmanuel comes back and says uh, the raising of the taxes for social protection is really devastating in Africa. It is not an option. So you know this this debate will go on. It's it's uh, it, uh, but it's it's an important it's an important uh, uh, debate in terms of the different uh, uh, the, the fiscal dimensions of this. Can, uh, we have a few more minutes left. Can I just raise a couple of just to, uh, uh, highlight the heterogeneity point? I think which I think comes through very strongly in this volume, uh, <clears throat> and that sort of struck me as being really uh, um, analytically interesting, but of course from the policy point of view also interesting. I mean, just as from the analytical interesting point of view, if you look at uh, the, the the chapter by Chakravarti and Nayak, I think on uh, intra household aspects of uh, of of the of the pack, they point to cases in which uh, the bargaining power, in fact, shifted in favor of women because of the particular nature of the thing. And they're they're very localized, very specific. I understand that, but uh, that only highlights, it seems to me, the heterogeneity dimension that we really have to look at this thing very very carefully. And then with the heterogeneity, one comes to a, so, something of a paradox, which is heterogeneity may suggest you want very targeted policies, uh, but you know targeted policies are difficult to do. 
And so, in fact, it may well be that universalism is uh, is would be the response to high degree of heterogeneity, if, if you see what I mean. Because once once the crisis, when the crisis hits, and there are so many different dimensions of it, covering each and every aspect with a separate policy, once the crisis hits, is 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 going to be very difficult to do. Uh, and therefore, a more universal approach, saying no matter what the no matter what the situation. The government is going to be is going to be providing support in in this way that way. I think might be a I think it adds support to universalism uh, in our in our thinking on 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 social on social protection. Perhaps paradoxically, on the other hand, uh, the point that Kunal made about how new technology is actually helping us to better target uh, uh, in these ways makes in fact make the argument go in the in the other direction. So I think these all these things have come up. As a result of our thinking about an empirical analysis and experience with with the with with the crisis, and I think what the book does well uh, is, of course, it lays out the empirical experience, but what it also does is says, okay, let's now think about the next crisis to come because there there surely will be the next crisis to come. Uh, point one and point two is the structural issues of the informal sector uh, will, will will be there. <laughs> Uh, uh, even after this COVID thing has passed, which it has, and even after the next crisis has passed, it has. So we have to think about those structural aspects as well. So those are the things that I took away from this, uh, uh, from from the volume. So uh, concluding comments from uh, uh, from uh, Marty, uh, Mike, and then Kunal as the director of wider can round things off. Marty, <laughs> um, for me, I think universality we should think about in terms of the social policies. Mm. The social and in terms of public goods, right? Mm. That there should be universal access and fair allocation. On this, on the targeted and the more specific, I think it we should have the supply chain analysis. We're concerned about supply chains because at the high end, but we should look also at the low end and have more specificity as to how the different uh, economic relationships work and which sectoral policies are important for different groups of workers. So I think it's it's not an either or, it's, it's, mm. it's both, but more universality when it comes to the social policies and specificity on the, on the economic. But the point is to bring in the economic policies and not leave it just to, um, to social policies, bring them, workers into the economic policies so that you get redistribution, redistribution through the growth process itself, not just through social policies afterwards. Okay, great. Uh, so Mike, and then uh, uh, Kunal. Yeah, you know, I think just a brief personal reflection on, on the contribution of the volume. Um, I think it was interesting that both the editorial team here and the, the many contributors we're aware that this book was going to come out well after COVID had sort of run its course, or at least it wouldn't be as intense as it was when we were when we started writing the volume. So we always intended for this to be, as, as I think you said quite eloquently, Ravi, about what does this actually mean about future crises or future development challenges? And I think one of the points of departure for many of the, the contributors is that we all want economic growth uh, and we all want people to be in decent formal jobs, but attaining that shouldn't be at the expense of supporting the vast majority of workers who are informally employed. And vast majority refers to 61% globally, but in the countries in which we've used as our case studies in, in this volume, it's often up to 80 or, or 90%. So how to get that balance, not just in dealing with future crises, but thinking about the labor market in the future. Uh, we had a workshop in Helsinki last year on, on structural transformation uh, and, and informality. So how do we think about these things with the reality that the, the vast majority of workers um, in the developing world are informal? How do we support their livelihoods through a combination of sensible policies, infrastructure, urban planning, and, and social protection, while we still achieve, aim to achieve um, economic growth and structural transformation. Thanks. Good. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mike. So let me just, uh, let's now hand over to Kunal to uh, some final concluding words and to, uh, and to bring this, uh, this webinar to its conclusion. Uh, over to you, Kunal. Yeah, thanks, Ravi. I think the, the one issue I'll just very quickly say is the following, that one of the things that we learned from the pandemic is that it took a magnifying glass to the absolute bottom of the labor market. 
and allowed us to see the vulnerabilities there. Uh, what we have called in a separate book that we have on the job ladder, the lower tier informal self-employed and lower tier informal wage employed, street vendors, homework, and so on. And I think the point that is there is that we should not be surprised actually to see how much that the pandemic affected these workers because they were really in a situation where they were anyway living hand to mouth. And we cannot have a situation again in the future where we see what we've seen with this with, with these workers who still probably haven't yet recovered from the pandemic. So how can we, social protection is one possibility, but also to try to find, to improve the livelihoods of these workers in different ways through, as Marty has been arguing in many different writings, trying to ease the conditions that they work in or on regulation so on. And we cannot therefore not in the next, in the future, not do something about this, because this is something we've learned, how much that group in particular, among other informal workers, were so badly affected by the pandemic. Thanks. Good. Well, let's then draw this uh, draw this to a close. Uh, uh, let's thank our speakers and thanks to the uh, uh, to those who were joined. Uh, safe journeys. Thanks.